Gentlemen, I'm sure, yeah, if there is, then I'm greeting her as well. Um, as you may know, my name is Tarinyewa Chowab. I am a lawyer based in Barara, but I'm also your OB. Uh, year 2003 up to 2008. Yes, hello. Good evening, sir. So, members, uh, those who were with me all these years at Montiera, of course, I know you and uh, you remember me. Those who joined us uh, for a level. Yeah, I do remember some of you and uh, most of you actually. So you are welcome to this uh, session. And I have the privilege and the pleasure to talk to my OBs um, about land matters so that um, we share knowledge that can be beneficial in one way or another. Um, today we are going to talk about seven topics. Seven topics and we'll discuss them briefly. I have already three questions which were sent in my inbox area as I had requested and I think um, I'll, re I'll respond to them after we handled these uh, seven topics. The first topic is forms of land ownership. What are the forms of land ownership? And number two is how to acquire title how to acquire title. And number three is transfer of ownership of land. And number four, Agaba James requested me also to discuss a power of attorney and letters as well administration. Uh, I think, yes, in relation to land matters and uh, Number five, to discuss the issue of squatters on land. Then to discuss ADR, which is alternative dispute resolution, and talk about why, why would anyone need a lawyer in land matters. That's the last topic of this evening. Uh, so, if you will allow me, I will briefly talk about the forms of land ownership in Uganda. Number one, it is called customary land ownership. And what is customary land? Uh, customary land is one which is... Uh, inherited uh, land that is owned by a family or a community under customary tenure. Um, you see, land that is not registered under the Registration of Titles Act we can refer to that as customary land as long as you got it from your lineage or your family uh, or your community. Such land is, is the commonest in Uganda, the land that is uh, owned 
out of inheritance uh, and is owned uh, like under the traditions traditions and customs of a certain community. Uh, for example, I may say Angkore. In Angkore, when your father has given you land and it is not registered, that means you have inherited that land as he also inherited it from his uh, tradition or customary parents. However, we should also note that customary land can also be registered. Yes, you may hold customary land without a land title, but if you wish, uh, you can register the same and we call it uh, acquiring a title, which is our next topic. How do you acquire title? If that was in response to customary land, or whether it was in regard to land that's already registered and you want to acquire your own title in your names, uh, basically we shall look at uh, acquiring a title under customary land ownership. So I, I guess that we have understood what customary land is. We have also another type of land ownership in Uganda, which is called uh, Milo, Milo Tenwa or Milo Tena, which is uh, basically in the Buganda area. We have uh, Milo and we have private Milo. Uh, this is uh, basically in the, the areas of central Uganda. And it is a land that was um, allocated to the Kabaka uh, by the 1900 agreement uh, and that land belonged to the Kabaka up to now and the Kabaka holds that land although many people occupy that land as uh, Kabaka's squatters there on his land which we call Kabaka's land uh, Milo land and uh, you are only required to pay uh, ground rent which is in Uganda called the Busuru uh, and when you have done that you can even get your land title on that land which is Milo Tena uh, the other land is registered land, which is a land that is uh, governed by the Registration of Titles Act, which is a registered land, and uh, and uh, once registered as a, as a, as a, as an owner of that land, we call it in legal terms freehold. So you have a freehold, you have uh, you have uh, a cust you have customary land, you have Milo land, which is uh, Mario Tena, and uh, lastly we have a leasehold. A leasehold Tena is one where you have land, but is land that is applied for from the district. It is owned as as a as the district land or public land, but we, I, I, I need to let you know that all public land belong to the district's land boards. Uh, we have Kampara land board and then other areas on land, you apply to the district land board for a, a lease or city land boards or in in, in Kampara uh, there is Buganda land board uh, which governs the the Milo land of the Kabaka but there is also the Kampara land board which is uh, which governs the land around Kampara 
So you you apply for a lease. So now we know that we have five types of land ownership in Uganda, which is one customer land, which is inherited or uh, give, given by your family or inherited from your parents or uh, or from your community, depending on how your community holds the land. And two, we have freehold tenure, which is land that is registered in your names. Uh, for example, once, once you register the customary land into your names, it becomes a freehold title, and you own it uh, without uh, any other person's uh, rights on it. Unlike the the leasehold and the my my tenor where you have to keep on renewing and paying the ground rent. So with that, we shall go to the second uh, topic of tonight, which is how to acquire title. Like I said, uh, when you want to convert your customary land into registered land then uh, I said it is possible where you can get registered and uh, yes, before I go into that uh, uh, I want also to discuss or uh, to let you know that you may want to you may want to keep it as customary land and also acquire title uh, I, I, I want us to be very clear there you can register it but it remains customary if you want to if you want so because under custom you may find that uh, there are many uh, other people with the rights on that customary land, but you wish to register it. Like I said, it can belong to a family or a community. So if your family decides to register your customary land, it is allowed. And the section or the law is the Land Act. And the Land Act uh, sections four and, uh, and regulation three. You, you apply for registration of your customary land and you get a certificate of customary land ownership. Yeah, but sometimes a person may want to convert to convert the customary land into a freehold and that is a, another topic that we can also look at. Uh, there is the third topic which is the transfer of ownership. Transfer of ownership is um, uh, one, when you have a, a, a purchase agreement and someone has a title and intends to transfer to you, therefore what happens is he will sign a transfer form and uh, with your transfer form, you'll go to the Registrar of Titles. We have regional offices uh, in uh, almost uh, all the regions of Uganda where you meet a Registrar of Titles uh, and present your transfer forms together with the original uh, sale agreement that you purchased the land buy and also present your both yours and the seller's national IDs and uh, in a short while the registrar of titles will create your title because you have presented those uh, few documents but most importantly is that uh, uh, the seller must have even new transfer forms um, and given you uh, a copy of his national ID and uh, also which is um, encouraged is to be present 
uh, before the registrar so that in case the registrar has some reservations or questions can be posed to both of you for explanation and the transfer will happen. We, um, the next topic is uh, the power of attorney and letters of administration. Yeah, power of attorney is a document uh, where you sign to authorize someone to act for you and on your behalf. So, a power of attorney in land matters, uh, it happens in uh, in scenarios where, uh, for example, you have authorized someone to purchase land for you. Such a person may need a power of attorney to sign on a purchase agreement for you. Um, in uh, other instances, is where you ask someone to act for you in a court of law. Someone is suing on your behalf. So such a person needs a power of attorney. We have two types, one which is general and one which is uh, specific. One which is specific is, uh, it is only centered for a specific purpose and can only do that and uh, <coughs> will have no further authority to act on your behalf. But if it's a general power of attorney, then a person may act for you in so many other areas, in court, in the purchase of land, in a transfer of land, in a buying a car, in a buying a... Uh, so, like, we need to distinguish, but the power of attorney generally is a, a document that authorizes a third party to act on your behalf, especially when you are out of the country or if you are too busy or if you are not in the in the jurisdiction or within the area where the transaction is happening and letters of administration uh, letters of administration uh, it's a document that is issued by court where a person has passed on and has left no will and then the family appoints a representative a legal representative to represent the whole family in the estate of the late or deceased person so such a person applies to court and gets letters of administration which will authorize that person to act as if he was in the shoes of the deceased person to perform duties uh, in the estate for the protection of the estate or for the division or uh, distribution of the estate uh, so that the rights and uh, interests of all beneficiaries are catered for by the administrator who holds the letters of administration. Uh, when pa a person has died without a will, that's when you apply for such letter of administration and uh, it's quite uh, a process where the family has to sit and appoint someone then that someone has to go and apply for a certificate of no objection from the administrator general's office and uh, that person uh, goes to NIRA and obtains a, a death certificate to prove death and then applies to court for such letters of administration. The duties of the administrator is to equitably distribute the estate um, so that it is protected from wastage. Uh, maybe if someone is noting I, I i will receive some questions about what i have already discussed above so that uh, but not now so issue of squatters now that's the uh, the second uh, last issue of squatters squatters are people who occupy land uh, with or sometimes without the permission of the landowner 
a squatter is one who is occupying land that does not belong to him. Uh, like I said uh, in uh, some parts of of Buganda or Central Region, we have landlords on uh, Miro land, uh, landlords on uh, private Miro, but they are absent. Uh, we call them absent landlords. So people occupy their land. So such people are called squatters. And uh, those quarters have always been uh, evicted. I know they they obtain some rights over that land, especially when they have occupied that land for a good time, especially 12 years. Then squatters uh, obtain some rights over that land. Um, and to evict them is quite hard, but uh, that is some um, long discussion. Because uh, I, if I go to discuss the issue of squatters, I may have to talk about how they entered, whether they had permission or whether they had no permission, and uh, whether they have stayed on that land as licenses or as tenants uh for how long so but basically that's the issue of squatters uh, some people occupying land that does not belong to them uh, for some time and undisturbed let me say undisturbed because when you occupy land and the owner of the land has not chased you then you we can call you a licensee in that right and when you occupy it for more than 12 years um undisturbed we call you um we call you a bona fide occupant so to evict such people it's a quite a long process now we can go to the issue of adr which is alternative dispute resolution the topic of adr means that uh, some people will not opt for court to resolve their disputes disputes are always there but uh, even courts encourage uh, some forms of alternative dispute resolution without without resorting to courts without lit uh, litigation Litigation is where you hire, where you sue somebody and then somebody has to defend and then the matter takes long in court and you have to incur costs of uh, lawyers. Even if you are self-represented, you incur costs of travel, costs of... Uh, yeah, so in ADR, we are saying there are modes of Resol resolving your dispute without going to court. One of them is uh, mediation. Mediation is where you appoint a med uh, uh, you can say especially mediation works where you have already filed a suit but the court has not taken it up or has not set dates for a hearing and then they ask the parties to mediate before they can uh, litigate or before they can start hearing the matter. So the court appoints a mediator who is an independent uh, uh, referee or arbitrator um, to hear the matters. Uh, most times the mediator does not or is not even supposed to decide for the parties. In mediation, it is always about the parties to decide on what they want and reach an amicable settlement and then they sign what we call uh, a consent a consent agreement so with mediation uh, the mediator sits there and asks the parties how in the best way they want their matter to be resolved we have also arbitration we have um, uh, negotiation, 
and uh, and uh, and reconciliation so so many avenues uh, which are under the arbitration and reconciliation act and uh, which are really very important and sort of a lot of uh, problems outside the court because the courts are also uh, full and uh, overstretched with a lot of cases so with the ADR which is being promoted we'll see arbitrators mediators conciliators uh, and uh, doing that job which uh, would have which has been uh, in, 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 in place and which has been very important. And the last topic is t- tonight is why do you need a lawyer in land matters? Uh, that is something I will discuss in relation to what we call the, the principle of, of due diligence. Due diligence means due diligence means that when you are purchasing land, then you need to take extra caution. Uh, there are things to look out for. So uh, when you when you don't do that, and then there are mistakes that you do, uh, the courts will not really give you uh, mercy we call it we call it uh, due diligence because you're expected to be vigilant in uh, doing land transactions and what are some of those uh, due diligence in land matters uh, we, we we can talk about if it is land title if it's a land, registered land and you are you are buying registered land look at the land title when you look at the land title, uh, find out is the person who's registered the one selling to you. So compare their national ID, compare uh, the, the, the photos, the picture and the national ID. Look at uh, look at him. Uh, is he known in the community? Uh, is the title? If, if you are talking about the title, have you engaged a surveyor to establish that what you see on the paper is what is on the ground? Now, that is what we call due diligence. And uh, you need also to talk to the local authorities around the location of the land and uh, the neighbors, neighbors of that land, so that they confirm to you uh, that uh, they know the seller. You may also need to look at what we call the encumbrance page. Encumbrance page on the land title is uh, is uh, page number about page number three, where you find that if if that uh, title is pledged in the bank, the bank will have registered itself on the encumbrance page behind to show that they have an interest. Uh, that is if the title is mortgaged in the bank. And when you don't find those things that your title is clean, and when you find that there are other people with encumbrances, we call them third party interests, then you don't buy. Especially some people have lodged caveats on that title. A caveat is a, a document that someone is objecting to any transfer or any dealings on that land because they have their own interest on that very land so you may find that a caveat has also been registered on that uh, land title so when you find such then you don't buy uh basically that is uh why you may need a lawyer in uh, in land matters to guide in uh, due diligence when you don't do that and someone has sued you to recover the land and you are the defendant, the court will not give you mercy because it will consider that you were also negligent eh? or you were, you did not carry duty. When you don't do that, it's your duty as a buyer. When you don't do it, 
we the court imparts fraud on you and you know fraud uh, fraud is a is a very serious offense and can lead to the cancellation of title most titles that have been cancelled are because of the fraud so somebody who has not done due diligence uh, fraud is imputed on them and uh, they have no defense because it is a duty that they should have performed it before they pay their money and get registered on the title so uh, we have a, a case which is very common it is called the Bajire, Bajire John versus Aus Matovu. Bajire John versus Aus Matovu. It is a court of appeal case. Uh, the judge said that land, lands are not vegetables that are bought from unknown sellers, that they are valuable properties and buyers are expected to make thorough investigations, not only of the land, but of the sellers also before purchase so you can see uh, here the judge was saying that the land is not like vegetables where you go to the street and purchase vegetables and even without looking at the face of the seller eh, the lands require thorough investigations like i have mentioned above and that is uh, why you need a lawyer in such land transactions so that they guide on due diligence. Um, maybe the other issue is to find out whether the seller is married, because once the seller the seller is married, then you require a spouse or consent. Spouse consent is where the spouse or the wife signs, wife or husband signs for such a transaction to happen. If without that, then the sale is not and void, it's illegal, and uh, it's fraudulent, and at any moment, the title can be cancelled and you lose. So, uh, basically, that's about why you need a lawyer and such a uh, land transaction. Now, uh, at that point, I can take questions as I have also a few questions, three which were sent in my inbox before. One which is that to application of buying a chivanja on a caveated piece of land. And two, how do you like how do you legalize a chivanja on a caveated piece of land, especially where the title is owned by a family and the caveat was re registered by only one member and the rest of the family are willing to relinquish their interest think uh, no, no let me not mention but it's about he says that the father is too old that the family heir is also is too old And, uh, that, uh, and that he has done nothing to unite the family and or done nothing to dispute the estate, yet his grandfather had three families, a new generation changed the leadership. So uh, those are the three questions I have, which I want to respond to, but I can also take more so that... Uh, in a few minutes that we are left with, we can respond to to all of them. Any questions? Okay. Uh, thank you, Jacob. Rather, Joab, Council Joab, for that wonderful presentation. Uh, uh, this is how we are going to approach it. Council, you're going to first take those three, then those who are interested in asking you raise your hands i'll be able to pick you so we shall take three now then we shall take another set of three and then we shall take others from the what i see someone in the in the chat ole we shall be able to take Ole's question later so you start with that those who are interested please raise your hands i'll be able to pick one at a time thank you okay thank you very much 
Now, I have noted the always questions, question as well, and uh, I respond to it as well. He's asking whether the lease that is uh, expiring in 49 years, whether he can, uh, whether he can chase all the. It was owned by grandparents and it is on public land. So he's saying, and they all died, and he's asking the lease was 49 years and is about to expire. If we can take the land, I get the reason to chase all people. Well, let me start with that. Um, what we should know is that uh, we no longer have public land. What used to be public land was removed by the amendment of the Land Act. So the people uh, that applied to take that land have since taken it. It is uh, now uh, land. But he says again that it was a lease. So a lease that was on public land has now turned into a lease that is owned by the district land board. Now that lease, if it, if it has not expired, it is very prudent now to apply. Uh, I don't know if your grandparents have administrators to their estates, but such administrators can apply to renew that lease and it remains in the uh, family. Uh, in, now in the names of the administrators who have taken up the estate. Now, and uh, when if, if you are one of those administrators or a beneficiary, then you take your share of the land uh, as given to you by the administrators. I hope that is uh, quite clear. Now, let me go to these other questions. The implication of buying a chibanja on a caveated piece of land. Uh, it is not possible. Well, it is possible to buy a chibanja on a caveated piece of land, but you will not get uh, a transfer. In fact, that's what I have all, uh, been discussing earlier, that uh, when you want to buy land, check whether there is a caveat. If there is a caveat, it means that someone else has an interest in that land. So before you buy, uh, make sure that the interest of those third parties are catered for and the caveat is removed. Therefore, you can uh, obtain a good title without third party claims. So that's the implication of a caveat on land. And the, the, the second question is, how do you legalize a chivanja on a caveated piece of land? To legalize a chivanja on a caveated piece of land is to ask the, the one who sold to you uh, that chivanja to cater for the interests of those third parties who lodged the caveat. Because the caveat is lodged by someone who has a right on that land, let their rights be catered for, let their interests be catered for. If they are beneficiaries and uh, they are not willing to sell, then let the administrator distribute the estate so that each, each, each beneficiary gets their own share and then you can buy from one which is not caveated. Uh, then uh, the last is a father is too old, the son is too old, the heir is too old, and has the administrator is too old and has done nothing to unite the family. So you are the grandson. Now, you being the grandson, it is true you have uh, the rights over the land of your grandfather. That is, that is uh, especially if you were totally dependent on him. So you have the same rights as your uncles. If you are totally dependent on your grandfather, you have the same rights as your uncles in his estate. But if you are just a grandson, then your father has better rights over that land than you. Now, if the administrator is also your uncle and has done nothing and is too old, your only remedy is to apply to court under uh, section 200 and, uh, 234 of the Succession Act 
and you say that you want to revoke their letters or administration for good cause. Good cause meaning that they have failed their duty, that the administrator has failed their duty of distributing the estate. And two, that he's too old even to manage the estate. Now, the court will look into your application and uh, revoke the grant to your uncle who is too old and uh, if you have been chosen by the family you can get the letters of administration and do the duty of an administrator which is to protect the estate and to effectively distribute to the beneficiaries i hope uh, I thought it's a short answer, but I hope it gives you some highlight. Now, the, the other question is whether uh, it is by Darius. I, in the case of obtained land before marriage, and my marriage isn't registered at URSB, so I want to sell or dispose of. Do I need consent or approval from my wife? Remember, title is in my name. Well, well, that is a, a good question, which I can only answer that uh, in marriage, you have a right to own property individually, but there is also property that we call matrimonial property, or which is family property, where the, the spouse must sign. Uh, it will all depend on you as spouses. If you choose to own property individually it is allowed by law if you choose to own property as a family where you have a land argument saying that uh, myself and my wife have purchased this land or where you find that in your title uh, both names appear both names of both spouses appear then that is it can be quantified as matrimonial property where your spouse must sign before you sell it off. But uh, marriage being registered or not registered at URSB, as long as it is a marriage. You see, um, a customary marriage doesn't need to be registered. That is the law. If it is a customary marriage, it does not have to be registered. To register it, it's, it's an option. Uh, okay? So it still qualifies as a marriage and she still qualify as your spouse to give your spouse a consent as long as it is family land now as long as your father gave you land for example and said i'm giving you my children this is between you and your wife to take care of your children that becomes family land unless you are to say that you you have been buying land in your own name and you own it individually still that is your land and it cannot qualify as family property you still have that right now the other question from west jahirare is i bought land four years ago and even obtained the transfer forms but i have not effected the transfer is there any bad effect to this there is no there is no bad effect only that uh, when you delay uh in in law we have a saying that equity aid is the vigilant or equity helps the vigilant if you are very vigilant then you take steps in time that's what it means to be vigilant you are taking steps in time and uh, and not to be indolent to be it says equity aid is the vigilant and not the indolent and to be indolent is to be less fair and take things uh, uh, easy as if. But the effect to this is that uh, the seller can sell to another person and then you realize that your land is no longer there, especially when you did not lodge a caveat. So it is important that when you get the transfer forms, then you move with the original agreement, you move the original idea of the seller together with the seller if possible to the register of titles and so that uh, you apply to create your own title. Uh, what happens if the head of the family dies without a will or administrator in the family can't agree on how to share the property? Or if the head of the family leaves a will but some of the family members dispute the will? Uh, okay, now this is from 
a cream or right now if the family head dies without a will that means you shall apply the family will sit and appoint a person to apply for letters of administration who will go now to the administrator general to get a certificate of no objection and then make an application before court if it is a, a valuable ranch above 50 million the application goes to the high court if it is a small estate then the chief magistrate court can handle now uh if the family can't agree on how to share the property uh, well if they don't agree then the administrator will uh, will decide for them but he should act judiciously and equ make equitable distribution uh if the family members dispute the will now there are only a few a few ways how to dispute a will one if the will is not signed is not signed by one who made it you can dispute it if the will is not dated is not dated by the one who made it you can dispute it if the will has left out properties or has left out uh, some some of the children without a reason you can dispute it eh? and if the will uh, was made by a person who was insane at that time and you can prove it was not in their right sense of mind you can dispute the will now without all uh, and without witnesses if a will is not witnessed by two witnesses or more then you can dispute it so without these grounds there is no other way that you can dispute a will can i repeat it was not signed it was not dated it left out some of the beneficiaries or properties without explanation or it was not witnessed by two or more witnesses so you can dispute the will there are no other reasons to this or if the maker was at the time of making it insane or in not or not in a good mental state you can dispute it otherwise there are no other reasons so when you say the family members have have disputed the will those reasons must be present otherwise it it still remains valid now the other question is that is there a standard fee that lawyers charge to draft a sales agreement <laughs> and you are laughing there are some emojis yes um um i have uh, there is what we call the advocates remuneration rules and the advocate remuneration rules provide for the standard of how much each document each transaction each case each uh, should be charged uh, by a lawyer so um, usually it, it states in in terms of percentages but that does not limit the the lawyer's uh creativity or mercy to charge you less or more uh, because we have the contract act which gives all ugandans freedom of contract so that you can always agree in a contract on the terms that are really favorable to you yeah but we the standard is there depending on the value of the land that you are purchasing the standard is there uh, in terms of percentages and it is uh, if it if it is a very very expensive land then the percentage is very very low if it is very very cheap land then the percentage is quite higher uh, that is but it is under the advocacy regulation rules for drafting all documents I hope I have answered most or all, all of the questions and uh, and uh, I thank okay. you very much for listening. Okay. Thank you Joab. Uh, I saw someone who had raised the hand. Mwesigwa Mwesijehirali. 
I really mm. don't know whether it's the question that you typed or you would like to fire the second question. Mwesu mm. Guahirare? Hello. Yes. No, it was the same question I've asked. Thank you, Council Job. Thank you for your insight. Thank you so much. Okay. I see Katondwachi raising the hand. Please, Katondwachi, you can fire your question. Darius Katondwachi. No, no, no. My question has already been answered. Thank you. Have no question. Okay. The floor is open for questions. The floor is open for questions. Uh, if you have any question, please raise your hand such that I can uh, allow you to fire the questions that you have. Okay, I can see. Hey, Ole, Ole, please, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Ashley. Uh, my question is simple and brief. Uh, I don't know if you can hear me, guys. I'm a bit in a noisy place. Do you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, we can hear you. So, okay, Job, uh, one thing I wanted to ask is about to the will let's say if i i give my own example if i die but i had a, a wife but we are not like legally married not in customary marriage but she was my wife and i put her in my will but we never got married like legally or customary so can someone dispute that she was not my wife Okay, can I answer that now? Yes, please do. Um, you are free to include anybody in your will. Okay, so any person that you name in your will to benefit from your estate, whether it's your wife or a child or a adopted child, a foster child, a friend, anybody that you include in your will can get a share of your will. So it's not about whether you included a wife or not. Uh, but again, if you included him, I mean, if you included her and mentioned that she's your wife, and she also uh, considers that she's your wife, and her family considers that indeed she she was your wife you see customary marriage has uh, just one requirement that you should have visited their parents and paid the bride price that's all only that and even if you don't pay the bride price although it is mandatory but if you don't pay the bride price and the parents waive that right either by letter and the, her parents waive the right, like give give away that right or give their daughter to you saying we have given up on the demand for, for the bride price. It still qualifies you to, to, to have your wife and uh, under customary marriage. So those are basically the, the two requirements. So uh, in a way you have mentioned you have included her either as a wife, but I'm, I'm emphasizing that even if she was not your wife and you have included her as a friend, still she will benefit from your will. Okay? I hope I'm, I've answered. Okay, I can see there is a question in the in the in the chat from yeah. uh, Dr. Dixon. You can answer that and then Ole can fire again because I saw him raising the hand. Yeah, I think Dr. Dixon, Dr. Dixon, your question is very simple. If your brother has planted coffee in your land, as a licensee, you will not have trouble evicting him after 12 years. Okay? But if he has 
entered your land without your permission and claimed it and you have kept silent for the 12 years i i, I hope you get the difference if somebody enters with your permission there is no way they claim that land even after 10 or 12 years because you authorize them to enter that land and the the, the principle of adverse possession does not arrive uh, to claim that land after 12 years but if somebody enters without permission okay and they claim it okwamba okwambitak somebody hahambita <laughs> carry away without your permission and then you do nothing for all these 12 years they have that right to remain on that land as uh adverse possessors because they have challenged you, you to be adverse to be an adverse is like to be an enemy because he entered expecting you to fight but you let the enemy stay so you cannot claim after those 12 years it's different from someone whom you have licensed or allowed to stay on your land uh, so the one who is licensed can can easily be evicted or can as well be asked to leave even after 20 years even after 30 years but one who entered force free and you did nothing that one can claim i i hope dr mkiria okay uh thank you joab uh, in case uh, uh, the response from the council does not satisfy your, your issue you are free to 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 revert with another question such that we can uh, utilize the council to the best of our ability Ole, you had raised uh, your hand, please. You can fire the question. Ole? Uh, actually, I think I've typed my question since it's loud here. But uh, I think he, he can read from the messages. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I've seen the question. I have seen the question. If I divorce my wife, am I entitled to share some of her property, just like women do share our property when we divorce? Well, uh, <laughs> uh, the answer is yes. The answer is yes because when uh, you see in 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 the divorce causes, the court distributes matrimonial property which is presumed to be a uh, joint which is presumed to be property for all of you equally so if she has purchased land and and it is in, in both your names and hers that is matrimonial property if you have property that is for the family eh, it is matrimonial property I think we shall have time to discuss what uh, matrimonial property entails in detail. But uh, land, uh, property that the family chooses to call home and from which they derive the sustenance, that's what, what is defined as matrimonial property. The, the property that the family calls, decides to call home and from which they derive sustenance. That's what we can call uh, family land or matrimonial property. Therefore, even if it was her property, but, but if you have chosen to call it matrimonial property, then you shall share that property equally, just like you as also, uh, you both. But also remember that you have a right also to acquire all the property separately from so that one can never be shared under under divorce it can never be shared it still remains your, your property uh, the case is uh, we, we are going to i'm going to refer you to the case of uhiriwe uhiriwe peace uhiriwe peace 
versus Kagwa Paul. Now, it is a case that it was very recent where the, the woman after 19 years in marriage walked away with only curtains and news that after 19 years of marriage the wife only left with the curtains uh, after divorce and the court could not dispute the property of this man because it was registered only in his names and that he had acquired it even before the marriage uh, personally like a husband uh, acquiring property in his names and his, in his own personal right therefore court found that the wife did not uh, was not entitled to any share of such property so many titles actually in the Kampara there are about about seven titles but the wife only walked away with the with the curtains because that's all her contribution of 2.8 million she had used to you know to to decorate the, the home uh, so you can see that the, the parties still have a right to acquire individual property but also as a family they can choose to call it a home and and derive sustenance together and you know have the titles registered in their names and you know use the land, the land together so in a way um you if you are a family whatever you have chosen uh, to call family property can be disputed equally but whatever you have chosen to call personal property then the divorce uh, petition will not touch it at all thank you okay uh thank you so much council for that uh, elaborate response uh, do you have any other questions colleagues uh, I can see all the questions in the in the chat have been answered. Yes, Zola, Zola. I see Zola has raised the hand. Please, Zola. Zola, please ask. Yeah, good evening, members. I know it was just a mistake. It was just a type. It was a mistake. Thank you. Okay. Do we have uh, any questions, guys? We should be able to conclude this in the next 10 minutes. If there are any other questions that relates to uh, property and land issues, please, this is your time before we can wrap this up. Yes, Hirare, Hirare Mwesije. Okay, thank you, Council. Once again, thank you, moderator. Mine is, I uh, wanted to get more clarification. There are times people will lease land, especially for farming, and out of the brew, you, you, okay, you make an agreement for lease, you find you've leased land for five years, and later the, 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 the landlord makes a decision to sell the land. So I, I want to understand, is there a need? Okay, you find maybe you do a win-win agreement after he has made that decision, but sometimes the compensation, is, can, you, can you be allowed to bring in a value to do a valuation of what you had done? How do you really go go about with the, with the, with the compensation program to, such that you can obtain a win-win agreement that is... Uh, beneficial to both parties thank you thank you very much Hirale. now that question uh, can be answered in the way that uh, once somebody has entered the contract with you to lease land to you for a period of let's say 10 years and now turns around and wants to sell the whole land uh, to, uh, to another person, a buyer now. Uh, now, it means that if he sells 
if he serves to the new person, it means that your lease has been terminated, which is premature. It has been terminated prematurely before the period that you had leased the land expires. Now, that also means that he has breached your contract. Okay? He has breached your contract. So, uh, in the circumstances, the only remedy you have is to sue him in the court so that you recover uh, the money that you paid for the lease, including damages, including uh, damage. Now, you recover, you can even recover because he's the only person that is at fault, the landlord is at fault for having breached your contract and for having breached the contract and for having terminated your lease prematurely before it takes before it reached the maturation now or maturity now if 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 that happens the only remedy is to sue him in a court of law so that you get your money back and you get uh, damages for the breach of contract plus the costs of, of the suit am i clear now if you become yes, yes. yes. but in, in that can do they do they include because sometimes you find you've even uh, elevated the value for land like uh, i don't know how i can say but you find maybe the land was bushy now you've cleared it you've maybe put some perennial crops or something that is really tangible so do you also consider the value for land that you've put the impact the value value cost that you've really made on the land Exactly. exactly. Now, when you are claiming for damages, you are claiming now those are called special damages because they are seen and they can be proved in court. Usually, uh, in court, you may need uh, receipts to prove the special damages that you improve the land in this way, this is what you purchase, this is what you put on the land. But even if you don't have receipts, you can prove by pictures showing that there is this development on land and it is cost it costs you this much. Therefore, this is special damage that special damages that I require from the court. And two, general damages. General damages cover mainly uh, inconvenience. Now, you have been inconvenienced because it was in a plan that you 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 do what you graze your cattle in a, in a time frame of ten years. Then you you have planned. Your family is expecting uh, returns on that investment, but your contract has been prematurely terminated. Now, in the general damages, you claim uh, inconvenience. You, con you claim psychological torture uh, because you have been uh, by by that termination, you have been uh, disturbed psychologically. And, uh, and therefore you claim general damages, special damages, and then costs, and then a refund of all your money that you paid to him because he's the one at fault. I'm clear now. Thank you, thank you. Much insight. I recently had that scenario, but now I, serve. I lost a lot because of not having this insight. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, well. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Council. I have one question for you. Uh, I've heard of uh, stories uh, where someone buys land, is given a title, and uh, after some time, uh, he gets to know that that land also has another title. Basically, one plot of land having more than one title. So how, what remedies can someone have if uh, he's faced with such a situation? Okay, thank you for that. Well, uh, in a, in a, but the survey has called it a double territory. But, uh, but uh, I would say, uh, I, I want to use one, uh, one maxim of equity which says that where two equities prevail, prevail where two equities prevail, eh, then 
Uh -uh. It says that where two equities abide, where two equities abide, then the first in time prevails. I hope that is uh, quite uh, hard to understand, but it simply means that uh, the the law will look at will look at uh, the instrument number and when was this title registered, and then therefore the first one to be created on that plot should prevail over uh, the subsequent one. Uh, double titling can sometimes be because of fraud or because of error. Therefore, the court usually cancels the, the subsequent title. But you are right, court, uh, to have the second title cancelled because you have prevailed before uh, the second title. So I will court prove that this one, they look at the instrument number of when the, the, the both titles were created. So it is through a civil suit to have the other uh, title cancelled and to have the whoever is claiming evicted. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. I'm giving uh, uh, 20 seconds to whoever has the final question for counsel and then we can wrap this up. Ashley. Okay. Yes, please. Yeah, I would like. I would. I would want to give uh, some more information about uh, Hakim. Uh, what Hakim was asking about divorce, taking the property from his wife. So I think the last ruling which happened in the court of appeal, I think it was in twenty twenty two. The ruling was like uh, it's no longer automatic that you will take some property, but it will depend on your contribution. Let's say a kid, let's say the wife is the one working and Akim is a stay home. And the duke Akim may not get part of the property because his contribution may not be valued. The same case with the, if the wife is a stay home and it's the guy working, the wife may walk out may walk out of marriage when is when she's empty handed. So I think for what the council say that I think they will share the, the property. It's not automatic. It depends on one's contribution. That's the submission I wanted okay. to add on. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Darius Katondrachi. Uh, Council, uh, I think now, you, if you can give us uh, the location of your farm, such that those guys who are able to link up with you, they can able they can be able to give you business. But please, guys, uh, when you link up with the council, please pay, 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 pay for the service. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I saw someone complaining on Twitter that uh, OBs and OGs. <laughs> <laughs> but you are very right. Surely, it's like any other profession that we have to pay. You are very right. Uh, I had someone complaining on Twitter that OBs and OGs want to utilize you. They don't want to pay. They expect to be served freely. But in the event that you link up with the council job, please pay, pay. You need to support uh, someone's hustle. So council, if you can uh, tell us your location, where you're located, address the your fields of expertise, such that guys can look out for you. Well, well, thank you very much. Uh, our firm is Mugara Muzia and Company Advocates. Mugara Muzia and Company Advocates, which is located at the uh, Nakumat building in, in Mbarara State. Uh, it is just on top of that fresco supermarket. On the second floor, it is uh, it is called Mbarara State Hall. We used to call it Nakumat building. Now it is Mbarara State Hall. The Honorable Minister Wamrama renamed it. It is his. Uh, it is in Barra State Hall, room 37 and 38 uh, in Barra State at that building, uh, Nakumat building, second floor, rooms 37 and 38. And we are Mugara, Musia, and Company Advocates. And uh, we did in uh, a lot of 
were things including land transactions or litigation family uh, corporate and commercial transactions and litigation and uh, and uh, let me look at uh, others but majorly myself that's what i did in um we, we also have mineral consultants and uh, we also do commission commissioner for oats and notary public so those are the services we offer uh, as you know law is so diverse so we cover various topics as as you come and as we we may guide hey thank you council thank you council i believe uh guys have picked the uh the the your your, your details so guys if you don't mind feel free to press that button as we appreciate council for the wonderful presentation and for the uh w good uh insights i believe this presentation has really added value to our lives and changed the way we we view things for instance me what i've picked the main point that i've picked is that uh when you're conned in a land transaction court will interpret it as negligence so please let's be steady let's try to carry out thorough due diligence in our dealings and transactions uh having said that i have some few annou announcements to make one